How you doing this morning? You awake? All right, good. Good, you can pray for me this morning. We, we have a 9.15 service for a reason. That's because the Spirit, I'm not filled with the Spirit till 9 a.m. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Just means I have to rely on the Spirit more. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 4. That's where we're at in our journey through the, the book of Exodus. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, grab a Bible in the chair in front of you. You can find it on page 41 in there. Uh, we are right in the middle of this conversation. Remember last week we left off where uh, Moses was out in the backside of the desert of Midian and all of a sudden God, a holy and righteous God, appear, appears to Moses in a burning bush. And the burning bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. And uh, last week, uh, uh, Moses had two objections. This week we're going to look at the last three of Moses' five objections, but I think it would be good for us to go back and set the scene for this conversation that God is having with Moses. Uh, back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, uh, God is calling Moses, finally, after 400 years of slavery, God is calling Moses, okay, Moses, now is the time for you to go set my people free. And Moses begins with this first objection. He goes, but who am I? Like, who am I? He says, uh, but Moses said to God in verse 11, he says, who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Um, and Moses is like, God, do you know who I am? I, I'm a wanted murderer. I'm a fugitive from Pharaoh. I don't know if you remember this, but the last time I tried to rescue God's people, it didn't work out that great, right? I mean, if you have to flee a country, you blew it, all right? And so this is where Moses is at. He's saying, who am I to do this? I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but have you ever felt like God was calling you to take a step of faith in pursuing after him, take a, a, calling you to do something that is far beyond yourself, and you find yourself looking at God and questioning his wisdom for picking you, right? I mean, couldn't you have found anybody else? To, to do this job, why me? Now, uh, look at how he answered this question. He answered the question with simply, I'll be with you. He said, I'll be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. Now, God doesn't give Moses a lecture on self-esteem. He doesn't say, Moses, you just need to believe more in yourself. You know, you're smarter, you're stronger, you're better looking than you think, all right? Moses does, God doesn't do that to Moses. He doesn't give him this pep talk. He doesn't go, you know, this uh, uh, self-empowerment speech. He doesn't go, you can do it, Moses. Yeah, look what God does. He just simply points Moses to himself, to the great I am. Like Moses, we're often way too prone to put our our. Uh, far too much reliance on our natural ability instead of the supernatural power of God at work through us. Now, uh, if God is with us, if God is with us, then we will be able to do his will even in spite of ourselves. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I'm super encouraged by how God graciously answered Moses. God could have tried to prove to Moses that he had all the skill uh, uh, and giftings and abilities to lead. I mean, he could have said, listen, Moses, you, you grew up in Pharaoh's. You've been to the best universities that Pharaoh has to offer. And besides that, you spent the last 40 years in the wilderness uh, being equipped to survive in the wilderness. I mean, if there's anybody that's ready to uh, uh, set God's people free, it's Moses. I mean, he was Egyptian enough to confront the Egyptians and Hebrew enough to love the Hebrews. But who else was better in position to do this than Moses? But uh, I, and all that is true, but I love the way that God answered the question. God, God just simply pointed him to himself. Now, if he had shown Moses that he was fully qualified, Moses would have relied on his giftings rather than his God. And that, and, and that would have changed there. I mean, we already saw what happened when he relied on his own giftings. Now he was going to have to rely on God. Uh, objection number two was, remember this from last week, who, who are you? All right? Now, like, like, okay, if, if I'm depending upon you to do this, who are you? And then Moses 
Uh, well, Moses goes to God and says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, in Exodus 3.13, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say? Now, if the success of the mission depended upon God rather than Moses, then Moses wanted to know who God was, and look how God answered him. He just simply answered, I am. He said, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. I am, I am your everything. I am all that there is. Rely deeply, deeply upon me. Now, God's answer to Moses was just simply to say that he was the eternal, self-existent, sovereign God who is at work throughout history and is at work in our personal lives. Now, this is the setting for which these three last three objections would take place. Now Moses is still standing in front of the burning bush, in front of a holy and sovereign and good God. Uh, but somehow when we get to chapter 4, he is losing the awesomeness of the holiness of God. At first we see back in chapter 3 that he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God uh, like he realized he was standing before a holy God, an all-powerful God, but now his unbelief was overriding, was overshadowing the truth of who God is. Now, you would expect Israel's deliverer to be this, uh, to be much more resolved with less hesitation. But I love the way that the Bible uh, portrays Moses. He doesn't portray Moses as some perfect superhero. No, he portrays Moses, it portrays Moses who, for who he really was, a flawed, weak human being. Now, I don't know about you, but that helps me to connect with Moses' story because I'm there. I'm an imperfect, flawed human being. And I love the fact that the Bible portrays Moses as he really was. It helps me connect with Moses, but it also helps me to trust in the great I am. And so here we are at chapter 4. It begins with Moses' uh, final three objections. Look at verse 1. He says, And Moses answered him, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. Now, uh, uh, Moses is objecting and saying, Okay, this sounds great but they're not going to believe me. I mean, they're not going to believe that there was a burning bush. There's not, they're not going to believe that the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. They're going to like come like, Moses, uh, how do we know you're speaking for God? And what is Moses going to say? I was before a burning bush that didn't get burned up. Right, right? Like, who's going to believe that? Unless they were there with them. And so here, here's, here's what Moses was struggling with. He was, he was struggling with the fear of rejection. I mean, remember last time he tried to save the Israelites? And when they found out about him, they asked him, who are you? Like, like who made you ruler and judge over us? I mean, they didn't listen to him then. Why would they listen to him now? Now he has this just crazy burning bush story to add to it, to confirm their, their uh, suspicions that Moses was kind of just off his rocker. That he wasn't just a murderer, he's an insane murderer now. Now, Moses' objections would be persuasive if it were not for the fact that uh, it was an explicit contradiction of God's word. Back in verse 18, God explicitly says to him in chapter 3, verse 18, he says, and they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. Uh, God's, God's saying that not only will they listen to you, they will own it as their own story. They will own it as though they were standing in the burning bush with you, before the burning bush with you, witnessing my words to you. But Moses continued to struggle with doubt. He's saying, but okay, well, what if they don't listen? Now, when God makes a promise and scripture is full of promises, Wisdom says, accept it. Don't argue with it. You see, by accepting it, 
You're, you're, you're confessionally, you're functionally, not just confessionally believing that God is sovereign and is good and he is who his, his word says he is and he'll do what his word says he will do. Now, Moses is struggling to believe this. He's struggling to believe in the word of God. Let, let me bring this down to an example. Let me help you grasp what maybe Moses is wrestling with here. Uh, for example, when it comes to sharing the gospel with uh, lost family members or lost friends or lost co-workers. Uh, it, it's, it's tempting, is it, is it just my experience? It's tempting to, like Moses, ask the question, but will they believe me? Or, or will they listen to me? Uh, here's what we need to realize. God has promised in his word that he would save people from their sins. And so far too often, we're putting way too much stock in our ability to communicate them as, uh, more than we are putting it in the transforming power of the gospel. This is where Moses was hesitating here in believing in the promises of God, just much like we do when it comes to sharing the gospel. Now, I, th I think it's interesting how God answers him. He gives three signs to Moses that were common Egyptian political and Egyptian symbols. The snake, uh, the, the leprosy, and the, um, the, the blood, the, 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 the blood from the river Nile. I mean, it, it kind of looks, I mean, we'll read it here in a second, but I'll be honest to you, with, with you right up front, it, it kind of seems like some Chris Angel street magic show going on here, right? I mean, you'll see it as it plays out. And so he gives Moses three signs. And the first sign, look at verse two. He says, um, he said to, the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. And so he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Now, the first sign is Moses, a staff turning into a snake. Now, God could have performed some mind-boggling uh, supernatural phenomena like throwing fireballs around or having the River Nile dance like the uh, fountains at the Bellagio Hotel. But look what God did. He said, hey, what is in your hand? Now, I think there's some pretty, there's some humor in this story because Moses is going to go, a staff, and he's going to go, throw it down. And it's going to turn into a snake, and Moses is just going to, Poof! he's gone, right? I mean, he is gone. And then God asks him, hey, pick it up by the tail. Moses is going, what? Are, are, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Now, I think there's a great deal to learn from this old staff. Uh, there is a great deal, uh, a lot for Moses to learn, who was still having trouble believing uh, that he could do what God was calling him to do. And I think there's a lot of lessons for us to learn. Let me, let me just give you a couple right, or a few just right now. The, I think the first lesson and probably the most obvious lesson to Moses was that God was sovereign over the Egyptian uh, uh, political and religious power. He was more powerful than that. You see, the snake represents a sign of Egyptian royal authority. I mean, think of the cobra-like uh, headdress worn as a symbol of authority. I mean, the snake was a symbol of Egyptian uh, power, for the Egyptians worshipped the serpent as a source of wisdom and healing. And in doing so, they were ultimately worshipping that old servant, the devil. Remember him from Genesis chapter 3? But by changing the stick into a serpent and back to a stick, God was declaring his authority over the gods of Egypt and even Satan himself. Now, the second lesson I think we can learn from this old shepherd staff is that, uh, and I believe what God was showing Moses was that he could use something ordinary like an old shepherd staff to do something extraordinary. Later, God uses Moses' staff to bring plagues upon the Egyptians to part the Red Sea and to bring water to burst forth out of a rock. If God could do all of that with a stick, imagine what he could do with Moses. 
Imagine what he could do with ordinary people like you and me. In this wonderful little sermon entitled No Little People, No Little Places, Francis Schaeffer, a great pastor and theologian who died in in the mid-1980s, pointed out that in order for it to become an instrument of divine power, the staff of Moses had to become the rod of God. We, we will see this happen next week later on in chapter 4. Schaefer went on to say, Consider the mighty ways in which God used the dead stick of wood. God so used a stick of wood can be a banner cry for each of us, Schaefer says. He says, Though we are limited and weak in talent, physical energy, and psychological strength, we are no less than a stick of wood. But as the rod of Moses became the rod of God, so that which is me must become the me of God. Then I can become useful in God's hands. The scripture emphasizes that much can come from little if little is truly consecrated to God or completely surrendered to the hand of God. Schaefer goes on and says, what Moses learned from the stick was that in order to be used for God's glory, he had to place his life in God's hands. To use Schaefer's expression, when we become the we of God, when we become the we of God in every aspect of our being, in every area of our lives, then God will use us for his great glory. Now, the third lesson is that God will ask us to let go of things in order to pick up new things. When God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? He wasn't asking Moses the question because he didn't know what a shepherd's staff was. He was asking the question because he wanted Moses to know what was in his hand. He wanted Moses to know what he was holding on to. His staff to this point represented his occupation for the past 40 years as a shepherd. It was his identity. It was his security. And God was asking him to throw it down. Now here's what was going to happen. Moses was going to throw down a staff which represented him shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law. And he would pick it up as a staff that he would use to lead his father's people, his father's children, the children of Israel out of slavery, and out of, uh, and into the promised land. Now for Moses, the thought of that had to be scarier than grabbing a snake by its tail. Because he had to let go of everything that he had put his identity and security in since he had fled from Egypt. Now let me ask you this morning, what are you holding in your hand that is keeping you from answering the call of God for your life? What is it that you are putting your identity, your security in rather than Christ? Because here's what God's going to do. He's going to ask you to let that go. He's going to ask you to stop holding on to it. And so that he can call you to, to, to live the life he's called you to live. Now, the second sign that God gave Moses was a diseased hand and the healing of it. If God could use a stick, he could also use the hand that held it. Look at verse 6. It says, again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. And so he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Um. And he said, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may, may believe the latter sign. So here's what, here's what Mo, God had Moses do. He's like, Moses, Moses, take your hand, stick it in your cloak, take it out, Poof. leprosy, white as snow. And then God goes, hey, Moses, stick it back in your cloak. He sticks it back in his cloak, pulls it right out, Poof. healed. Now, for the Egyptians, leprosy was uh, rampant in their culture. And it caused an incredible, incredible amount of fear. And all the power that all the Egyptian gods had could not heal leprosy. And here's what Moses is going to do. 
He's going to go right at the worst fear of the Egyptians. He's going to put his hand in his cloak and it's going to come out leprosy, white as snow. And they're going to be freaking out. And Moses is going to watch this, watch this. This is how powerful my God is. And he sticks his hand back into his cloak, pulls it back out, and it is completely healed. Now, it is obvious that God is going to declare that he is far more powerful than any of the Egyptian gods. Now here's the third sign, verse 9. He says, If they will not believe in these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Now, God gives Moses this third sign, which will strike directly at what the Egyptians saw as their primary source of life, the Nile River. Now, water symbolizes life. Spilt blood symbolizes death. And what God is going to demonstrate is that he has power over life and death. Now, here's what we need to understand about Moses. That Moses did none of these miracles. That it was God doing it through him. Now, The staff is Moses' staff. But what happened to the staff is clearly from God. It's clearly from Yahweh. Now, the hand is Moses' hand, but what happens to it is clearly from God. Now, the water in the Nile, which God used for his purpose, also belongs to God. But what happened to it was worked by his divine power. Now, together, all three of these signs prove that the God of Israel was superior to the gods of Egypt or the gods of this world, and that God was with Moses. Now, I think it's interesting that throughout Scripture, that that the snake represents the curse. Uh, Leprosy always represents God's judgment against sin, and blood... uh, represents, or or the Nile River represented the source of life. Now, Jesus became that curse, took God's judgment for you and me upon himself, and spilled his blood so that you and I may drink of the fountain of living water and thirst no more. Salvation is God's greatest sign that he is with us. Why would we ever, ever doubt him? But Moses is still struggling in unbelief. Look at the fourth objection. His fourth objection is, I'm not gifted enough. In verse 10, it says, but Moses said to the Lord, after all three of these signs, he's saying, "Uh, oh, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Now, honestly, I identify with Moses in this fourth objection. He was wrestling with deep feelings of insecurity and inadequacy. Now, when I was wrestling with my call to full-time ministry, I, I, the biggest barrier for me was wrestling with, am I gifted enough? Like, I, I grew up with severe dyslexia and a horrible speech impediment, which I had to spend seven years in speech therapy as a child. Now, like when God called me into full-time ministry, I began to question God's wisdom in picking me, right? I mean, I I totally, I mean, I, you know, if you're going to answer the call to ministry, it's helpful to be able to read, to know God's word, and it's helpful to speak, to be able to teach God's word. And I struggled with both of those, but God was kind of like, I'm still picking you. I'm still picking you. Now, evidently, Moses struggled with some kind of speech impediment. Whether it's a studying problem or a confidence problem, we can only speculate. But I do find it interesting that in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it tells us that Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. And so something must have happened. In the time he fled Europe, uh, Egypt as a 40-year-old man and spent 40 years in the desert. Now, it may well have likely been that he just lost his grasp of the Egyptian language 
by uh, spending his time 40 years in the backside of the desert. But uh, what's more evident in the context of this immediate text is that it was more than that he lost the grasp of the Egyptian language. It said he had lost his confidence. He had lost his confidence. Now, his objection was irrelevant. You see, he, so, he didn't have so much as a speech problem as an obedience problem. God had given him a clear and unmistakable call. But rather than trusting God to fulfill it through him, Moses just began making excuses. Now, I, I think we all can identify uh, with this in our calling to fulfill the Great Commission, to share Christ, Christ with the lost and dying world. We hold back from sharing our faith uh, for fear that we will not know what to say or that we won't say it very eloquently. And so our confidence or our lack thereof is in our ability and not in the power of the gospel. And so it's easy to identify with Moses because I think this is something we struggle with all the time. You know, Moses' fourth objection was irrelevant. It did not matter how articulate Moses was because God already told him exactly what it was he was to say. I mean, God practically dictated his speeches to him. Moses didn't need to be an orator. He just needed to be a reporter. He just needed to go and tell the people exactly what God had told him to do. He just needed to faithfully repeat whatever God had said to him to the people of Israel. He didn't have to be a great speaker because he was being called by a great God. And so the issue wasn't so much a speech problem as it was an obedience problem. And besides that, he seemed to speak well enough when he was arguing with God, right? Did you notice that as you were reading through this? I mean, for a guy with a speech impediment problem, standing before a holy and righteous God in a burning bush, his argument seemed pretty eloquent. And so I'm guessing it was more than a speech problem. It was an obedience problem. Now, some of you may be sitting here and going, um, I'm the least gifted person I know. Right? I'm not very gifted at all. Well, guess what? You are a perfect candidate to respond to the call of God in your life. He loves to use weak vessels like you and me to display his power and his glory. Now, not only was Moses' objection irrelevant, it was irreverent. Notice the wording of his complaint, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I mean, this comment is really a criticism against God. Moses is blaming God for not giving him the gift of speech. He's saying, I'm not eloquent either in the past. He was complaining about the way God made him. Or, or when he said, or since you have spoken, he's in play. God, I've been standing here for 15 minutes talking to you, and you still haven't given me what I've wanted. Now, God could have cured his speech problem right then and there. But then Moses would have relied on his giftings instead of his God. Now, God was, Moses was blaming God for his weaknesses. He's saying, been standing here for 15 minutes, you haven't done anything about my speech problem. By this reasoning, it's God's fault that Moses couldn't do what God had called him to do. How often do we complain about God, what, that God is not giving us what we want, when the real problem is we're not doing what he wants? I love how God answers Moses. <laughs> Look at verse 11. It says, Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be your mouth and teach you what you will speak. God answers Moses by reminding him that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. That, he knit the, that the very hands that knit him together in his mother's womb are the hands that are directing his life now. Now, Moses was given exactly the gifts that God wanted him to have. And those gifts were going to be used for God's glory. Now, these rhetorical questions are reminders that God has made us exactly how he wants us to be made. 
He gave us our eyes. He gave us our ears. He gave us our mouths. He even gave us uh, our, our disabilities. He asked the question, who has made man's mouth? Who has given him the strength, the abilities? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? He's saying, I, I, I am sovereign over all of your abilities and all of your disabilities. And I'm going to use both for my own glory. Now, every single one of us are uniquely and wonderfully made. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, uniquely designed to display God's glory both in our abilities and in our inabilities. And we need to let our lives be lived in the hand of God in such a way that he can display his glory in both. Now, here's the fifth objection. <laughs> Moses just says in verse 13, he says, oh my Lord, just please send someone else. Just please, anybody. Anybody but me, send somebody else. Now, Moses' fifth objection, this final objection, exposed what was underneath all of Moses' excuses, a fundamental unwillingness to obey. Now, Moses finished evaluating his call, and now he's rejecting it. He's saying, send somebody else. Now, he definitely felt inadequate and feared failure, but whatever the reason was, it didn't matter. Quite simply, he was refusing God's claim on his life. He said, God said, hey, put your life in my hands. I know what I'm doing. I made you. I wired you. I gave, your, gave you your abilities. I gave you your disabilities, and I want to use you for my glory. And Moses is like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Now, I love the way God answers even this objection. Look at verse 14. He goes, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, there is, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, is he coming out to meet you? And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth. And then you shall be as God to him. And then look at verse 17. He says, and take in your hand this staff, which you shall do your signs. In other words, God's going, go, go, go. Pick up your staff and go set my people free. Now, it seems like that God concedes by giving him Aaron. But if you look at the text closely, it's God saying, hey, your brother Aaron's already coming. In fact, when your brother Aaron shows up, he's going to be happy to see you. And not only that, he's going to be happy to see you, that I'm going to use him and I'm going to use you. And you will speak to him as I have spoken to you and you'll be as God to him. Like, God already had a plan in all of this. Now, sure, Aaron would cause Moses some great heartache later on, but I am absolutely convinced that God was working everything uh, uh, under his sovereign will to raise up this deliverer in Moses. Now, let me end with two questions. Uh, number one is God proved himself to you. Many people are looking for a sign from God. They want to know that, certain, that for certain that God is there, that he really is the God who the Bible talks about, and more importantly, that he is going to be with us. And so people ask for a sign. God, give me a sign. I'll really believe in you, but I first want a sign, some sort of sign for you. If you're really there, if you really are who you say you are, give me a sign. Now, the truth is, is that God has given us a sign, and it's a miraculous sign of epic proportions. It is a sign of an empty cross and an empty tomb. It is a sign that resounds throughout history. But the fact that God the Son entered into the messiness of humanity to redeem it, and he lived a perfect life, the life you and I desire to live, and he died an obedient death, the death that you and I deserve to die, and he overcame sin and death, leaving behind an empty tomb, overcoming sin and death on our behalf, is the greatest sign that God has ever, ever given us. Now, 
for the similarities between Moses and Jesus, for all the similarities of Moses and Jesus, there are some crucial differences. Jesus is not like Moses. One of the most obvious is that he was ready and willing to do God's will. He said, Father, here I am. I have come to do your will, O God. True, Jesus did agonize in the Garden of Gethsemane about the pains of the cross, but ultimately he said, not my will, but thine be done. And he laid down his life for us. He could have said, send somebody else, but he knew there was no one else. He and he alone could pay the atonement of our sins to redeem us and rescue us from the sin of slavery. His resurrection is the sign that Christianity is true. A sign recorded in scripture and confirmed by historical accounts from many, many reliable eyewitnesses. Anyone who is unsure of whether or not to believe in Jesus Christ as a sign of his, and the sign of his resurrection should ask God for the gift of faith and he will show you his salvation. I I love the story that Mark tells in his gospel of a father who came to Jesus whose child was possessed by a demon and was engaging in self-destructive behavior like throwing himself in a fire. And the boy's father cries out to Jesus. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus miraculously heals in response to the father's prayer. Are you struggling with unbelief? Are you struggling with trusting in the sign of an empty cross and an empty tomb? Well, cry out to God and say, God, help my unbelief. And he will give you eyes to see his amazing grace. Um, here's the last, last question I want to answer with is, does God still do signs and wonders? In much the way, the sign, same way the signs authenticated Moses' calling to, believe, to be a deliverer, the miracles of Jesus serve to authenticate his teaching and to prove that he really is the Son of God, the Christ. However, unlike Moses... Jesus was able to do his miracles all by himself because he is God. He is Yahweh. He has the power over life and death. He gave his life so that we may have life and not suffer under the slavery of sin and death. He came to set us free. That, that, that is the greatest miracle ever. Now, I think it's interesting that every miracle that Jesus did was to demonstrate his power over sin and death, and it affects upon us. I mean, he could have performed some supernatural signs like tossing fireballs around or making the Jordan River dance like the fountains of the Bellagio Hotel, but he didn't. Every miracle he did, Jesus did uh, to demonstrate his determination and his power to reverse the curse of sin and disease and death. Healing the blind and giving them sight. Healing the deaf and giving them hearing. Raising the dead and giving them life. Pastor and author Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, we modern people think of miracles as a suspension of the natural order, but Jesus meant them to be a a restoration of the natural order. The Bible tells us that God did not originally make the world to have disease, hunger, and death in it. Jesus has come to redeem where it is wrong and heal the world where it is broken. His miracles are not just proofs that he has power, but also a wonderful foretaste of what he is going to do with that power. Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts that the world we all want is coming. And it will come on that day when the King of kings and Lord of lords who has the power over all of the world's uh, political systems and religious systems will come day and restore, come someday and restore his kingdom. And so to answer the question, did God still perform signs and wonders? Yes, yes. Every single day he changes hearts of stone into hearts of flesh that beat for his glory. There is no greater sign than that. 
Salvation is the greatest sign of God's power and the greatest demonstration of his love for you and me. And so the question I really want to ask you this morning, have you experienced the saving power of God's grace? Because he is the deliverer for those who are trapped. And he did it by his body being broken and his blood being spilled so that our bodies wouldn't have to be broken and our blood wouldn't have to be spilled, that we could have life and life for all of eternity. Now, the only response to that kind of deliverer is absolute surrender, to place our hands in God's hands and to make our lives the very lives of God, to live every moment of our life in response to a great deliverer. Will you stand with me? This morning we're going to worship Jesus by taking communion. And here at Crosspoint, for those of you who are guests, we invite you to come if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if he is your deliverer, if set you free. If not, I encourage you to stay where you're at and contemplate, maybe even cry out, Father, I believe, help my unbelief and allow his spirit to minister his grace to you. And as you struggle with your unbelief, I encourage you to go back to those guest hospitality tables. There'll be leaders back there that will help, help you wrestle through your unbelief and help you understand what God's saving grace is all about. For those of us who are believers, I encourage you to come down and take the bread and dip it in the cup. And as you do that, say, God, I surrender to your hand. I let go of everything. Use me, my abilities, my inabilities for your glory. And then let's sing, let's sing with all of our hearts and rejoicing in what a deliverer we have.